In the early 1900s, when film, or moving pictures as they were first called, were just discovered, they were a huge moneymaker, and they just kept pumping them out. It was never considered that maybe we should archive them for historical purposes. And, as my film professor pointed out, about 90% of all silent films are completely lost. We could make video after video after video, but since it is the Halloween season, we're going to stick to horror films. Even within the horror genre, there are a lot, a lot of missing films. So this list will focus on the ones that I think are really interesting. But without further ado, this is the top 13 lost horror films. Robbing Cleopatra's Tomb There is one name that made a profound and legendary impact on filmmaking back in the earliest days of cinema, and that name is Georges Méliès. This is the person who pioneered special effects, most notably in his iconic film A Trip to the Moon. However, one of Méliès' earliest films is actually missing. That film is Robbing Cleopatra's Tomb, or simply Cleopatra's Tomb, which is also one of the first horror films ever made. In it, a man chops the mummy of Cleopatra into pieces, and then, quote, produces a woman from a smoking brazier, unquote. Cleopatra's Tomb got recognized by producer Charles Urban, who would later distribute all of Melius' future movies. This movie kickstarted Melius' career. Simply put, without Cleopatra's Tomb, there might not have been a trip to the moon, and all the pioneering of special effects that came with it. Yet, here we are today, still searching for the movie. Oddly enough, this film was believed to have been found in 2005, although it just turned out to be a different movie made in France that also featured an Egyptian-looking tomb. A Son of Satan A Son of Satan is a 1924 race film, meaning that it was produced primarily by an all-black cast for an all-black audience, as Hollywood typically excluded black filmmakers from the business. Since these movies were largely ignored by Hollywood, preservation is scarce amongst race films. It's believed that out of 500 made, fewer than 100 remain. A Son of Satan, on the other hand, ran into serious distribution problems due to censorship boards rejecting the film entirely based on its contents. Supposedly, the film depicted scenes of violence against women and animals, which the New York censorship law is objected to. Furthermore, the Virginia censors complained that the film referenced mixed relationships and believed that Southern ladies would have been deeply traumatized and offended. Eventually, the movie faded into obscurity even back in its day, and the last time the movie was spotted was 1924 during a New York State film exhibition. The Monster of Frankenstein this 1920 silent horror film predates the popular Frankenstein movie that would be made by Universal in the 1930s. The Monster of Frankenstein was one of the only horror movies made in Italy before 1950. This is due to the strict film code they had at the time, which limited what filmmakers could show. Because of this, the film's running time after it was edited for being too graphic is unknown. There are some reports that describe the movie as heavily cut down from the original release, with one heavily censored version supposedly being 39 minutes long. As of now, the only remnants of The Monster of Frankenstein are a few production stills and promotional material. Lock up your daughters. This Bella Lugosi film is about a vampiric doctor who experiments on young girls in an attempt to bring back his late wife. Stock footage from other Bella Lugosi flicks were used in this. Or was it? The problem comes from the fact that we have contradicting reviews from the time period. Some claim that this is a full-fledged movie featuring a lot of stock footage from films like Bowery Boys. Others claim that it's a compilation of clips from other films of Lugosi as a host, and that if you could identify every clip, then you would win a cash prize. This movie was produced by EJ Fancy and directed by Phil Rosen, a hardworking, well-known British film director. There's nearly no record of this film existing, and it's believed to have a private showing at some point, but was never released outside of England, making it more difficult to trace. Other than that, virtually no other evidence exists. The Terror 
there are many notable things about the terror. For starters, it may have been one of the first slasher films before the genre really kicked off in the late 70s. It's also only the second full sound movie made by Warner Brothers. The plot is actually very simple. A cast of kooky and strange characters, which includes a spiritualist and two men who just got out of prison, go to an inn where the terror, a mysterious killer, resides. All of them have an issue with the terror, and after a night of murder and horror, the killer's identity is unveiled. The movie did pretty bad, with its most notable praise being, it's not as bad as The Lion and the Mouse, Warner Brothers' first sound film, and the most scathing review being, the terror is so bad, it's almost suicidal. The men who wrote the stage play and script for this movie seemed to agree with the reviews at the time, as he said one of the most retroactively backwards comments ever. I have never thought talkies would be such a serious rival to the stage which led to the film being edited into two versions. One version converted it into a silent horror movie with title cards and the whole works, while the other is the talking version most people saw. Regardless, both are considered lost today. The Cat Creeps The Cat Creeps from 1930 was one of the first sound movies made by Universal, which also makes it one of the first sound films in general. What's interesting is that there are not just one, but two versions of this movie that are currently lost, both working from the same script, just in different languages. Back in the early days of sound film, it was just easier to shoot two versions of the same movie for different languages, as opposed to dubbing it like we do today. The Spanish version of The Cat Creeps was called La Voluntad del Muerto, or The Will of the Dead Man. Surprisingly, quite a bit of the film's plot is known because it's a remake of an older 1927 silent film titled The Cat and the Canary. To cut a long story short, it's an old dark house movie with all the usual tropes that follow with it. You know, the dark house on the hill surrounded with fog, and some sort of mystery that kills the guests off slowly but surely. What makes this film notable is that it's one of the first horror movies to kick off the universal monster movie craze in the 1930s, and it was even popular enough to get a remake in 1939. The 1939 film is not lost, but it completely abandons the plot of both the cat and the canary and the cat creeps. London After Midnight London After Midnight has been described by many horror enthusiasts as the holy grail of lost horror films, and rightfully so. Lon Chaney, also known as the Man of a Thousand Faces, plays Edward C. Burke, the man you see on the famous movie poster and production stills. Believe it or not, but the poster, just the poster, sold for more than $400,000 at an auction as it is one of the last remaining physical pieces of evidence that this movie even happened. Many newspapers at the time reported that the plot was a bit hard to follow and almost nonsensical. Sadly, the last known copy of London After Midnight was burned in the 1965 MGM vault fire. Some people believe that there are some private collectors that have a copy of the film, but at this point, it's just hearsay. If you still want to experience the movie, you only have two options. The first option is to watch Mark of the Vampire, which is a remake made by the same director and made in sound, but without Lon Chaney. The second option is by getting a look at the 45-minute reconstruction made by Rick Schmidlin and Turner Classic Movies. This version uses production stills, photographs, and lengthy text descriptions based on the script, this version was released as a part of the Lon Chaney collection. Knights of the Werewolf As Noches del Hombre Lobo, or also known as Knights of the Werewolf, is your standard universal era horror movie. A professor finds out that one of his students has lycanthropy and offers to help, but instead of helping, he manipulates the werewolf into attacking people he does not like for revenge. The story behind this lost film is actually more interesting than the movie itself. You see, we don't know if this movie exists. According to Paul Nashty, the film's lead actor, it was shot, produced, and ready to go. However, the director, Rene Govar, was killed in a car accident after the movie was shot. They sent it off into production, and then, nothing. The film essentially vanished. Paul Nashty himself claims that he worked with two other lead actors, Peter Beaumont and Monique Brainville but we couldn't find any evidence that those actors with those names during the time ever even existed. 
Furthermore, we can't find a director named Rene Guevara, who was even working in the film industry. Because of this, people have speculated that Paul Nashi may have made up this whole movie to help boost his resume when he was just starting out. We do know that a documentary was made to honor the legacy of Paul Nashi, titled The Man Who Saw Frankenstein Cry. In that documentary, we have what they claim to be a screenshot from Knights of the Werewolf. Also, it's possible that this movie was made just under a different name. The Fury of the Wolfman, or La Furia de Hombre Lobo, is another movie that stars Paul Nashi. However, it's in color, and the screenshot from the documentary is in black and white. The plots of both films are very similar, which could contribute to Paul Nashi's confusion over them, and it's just possible that he misspoke. In the Mind of the Damned Unlike most films on this list that were made decades ago, the strange thing about In the Mind of the Damned was that it was released in 2013 by the Dunlisk Film Group. That group is actually known for making strange, avant-garde, Z-grade horror movies like Melonheads. In the Mind of the Damned, however, was different from their typical production, as it was supposed to be less campy and more story-focused, following the mental health of the main character after an acid trip. They supposedly employed advanced film tricks such as shooting the scenes out of order to try and convey the effects of a narcotic through the language of film itself. The film was primarily shot in Eastern Michigan University, a now demolished campus, and reuses most of the cast from Melonheads. The reason why the movie is lost is because of how the actors did not like the film's plot, as it apparently featured a lot of drug use and murder. The film was available on a public domain website, only for it to be pulled down a little bit later. It's likely that the only person who has a copy of the film right now is the director and anybody who managed or bothered to download it when it was up for a couple of days. Dracula's Death Back when Dracula was not only a very popular and famous character, but was also copyrighted by Bram Stoker and his family, Many filmmakers wanted to make a movie based on the vampire. Most could not, so they had to work around it, for example, Nosferatu, which is supposed to be Dracula, but they changed his name to Count Orlok for copyright reasons. This brings us to Dracula's Death, a movie that is not really about THE Dracula, but rather an insane inmate who claims to be Dracula. The movie follows a woman who, after meeting the inmate in an insane asylum, begins to experience terrifying visions, and cannot determine whether they are real or not. Right off the bat, we already have a huge departure from the story by Bram Stoker, which is strange considering that this movie was a Hungarian production, so close to the actual home of the real Vlad the Impaler, who Dracula was based on. Regardless, this would technically make it the first movie about the titular vampire. Some claim that there were a few before this, but there is no real evidence to suggest that that is true. Furthermore, there is actually a lot of mystery surrounding this movie, such as how much it made and where it was released. It is unknown if the film was launched outside of Europe. We only know that it screened in Budapest and areas around Europe. The only surviving pieces from the film are its theatrical poster and a few production stills. The Cuckoo Clocks of Hell This 1974 gore-splattered flick is completely lost due to its obscurity and violence. Much like with Cannibal Holocaust, rumors circulated that this movie depicted actual murders, similar to a snuff film. Furthermore, the credits featured pseudonyms in place of the real names of the cast members, making the film look even more suspicious and difficult to track. The film was originally three hours long and initially screened as The Cuckoo Clocks of Hell. However, apparently, this movie was so violent that mass hysteria ensued. The theater goers rioted and started committing mass violence against one another. After being pulled from theaters, the filmmakers shortened the film to 77 minutes and re-released it as Last House on Dead End Street. As of now, the 77-minute version is seemingly available online for purchase, albeit scarce to come by. Only very few DVD copies even exist, and that's only for the re-edit, Last House on Dead End Street. As for the original three-hour cut, The Cuckoo Clocks of Hell, no known copies exist, although it's rumored that there might be a preserved theater reel, 
the New York Film Archive. The Golem Trilogy The Golem is a rarely seen monster from Jewish folklore originating from the book of the same name. A total of three films are made. The Golem 1915, The Golem and the Dancing Girl made in 1917, and The Golem and How He Came Into the World 1920. From the 1915 version, we only have a small scene of people running away from the golem while he stumbles around with a dagger in his chest. The 1917 version is completely lost as far as we know, although some people claim that a print exists in the Eastern European Film Archive, however we do not have access to it and it has never been publicly re-released. The 1920 version, which we do have, is a prequel to the 1950 version, which just confuses everyone into thinking that that's the first Golem movie. The Golem 1915 has a pretty basic plot. A man finds a Golem clay statue that was resurrected many years ago by a magical rabbi. He then resurrects him as a servant, only for the Golem to become sentient and fall in love with a girl, get rejected, and start killing people. The 1920 version follows the magical rabbi as he makes the golem to protect the Jews from religious persecution. As for the 1917 version, all we know is that it might be a parody? Other than that, no other information exists. This man. In January 2006, a patient of a well-known psychiatrist drew this picture of a man that has been supposedly visiting her dreams repeatedly. She claims she's never met this man in her life. Soon, more and more people from all around the world, at least 2,000, claim to recognize this man as someone who also visits their dreams too. Several theories have been made to explain who this man is, such as him being the manifestation of our subconscious, or even God itself. However, you can rest easy knowing that in 2010, this story was confirmed as a hoax in order to promote an upcoming film based on this man. Supposedly, the film was going to be directed by Brian Bertino or even Sam Raimi and was about an, quote, ordinary guy who discovers that people he has never met are seeing him in their dreams. Now he must find out why he is the source of nightmares for strangers all around the world, unquote. That's right, this film was going to star this man. Unfortunately, after the film was announced, no promos, casting announcements, or even updates were made. It appears as though this film has been abandoned. This man has always been one of my favorite creepypastas, so it's not really a lost film, more of a cancelled film, but I wanted to share it as an extra on this list. The Phantom of the Opera The Phantom of the Opera might be one of the most famous classic horror films of all time, and it is, in fact, a lost film. Now, you may be wondering, how is this a lost movie? It's famous. We have seen it, right? It's on YouTube. Actually, no. The Phantom of the Opera has one of the most convoluted, confusing histories of re-edits, re-releases in all of film history. So much so that I'm pretty sure I didn't get everything right because it's just that confusing. For starters, just in its release year of 1925, there were three separate versions of the Phantom of the Opera. The first version was shown to a select crowd that apparently hated the film, causing the filmmakers to re-edit it into the second version. This one had some new scenes added in, but was still received negatively. So they re-edited it again into the third version, which was released and was a big hit. Out of these three versions, the first two are completely lost, while the third one is just mostly lost. A few years later, when movie studios were transitioning to sound, the film was re-edited again and was even reshot with new scenes to include dialogue. What's strange is that Lon Chaney, the man who played the Phantom, could not return to record his dialogue as he was under contract with a different studio. Also, the filmmakers weren't even allowed to dub Lon Chaney's performance over with a different actor's voice. So whenever his character showed up, they just used title cards, even though almost every other character had voices. Now here's where it gets really convoluted. The most famous reconstruction of the movie was made in the 1950s, which is called the Eastman print because it was printed by the Eastman house. What's odd is that this version has slightly different shots of the movie. When Phantom of the Opera was first being filmed in 1925, they used two cameras side by side with each other. So you can very faintly tell that the angles are slightly different. Then there's also the 16mm show at home print made by Universal in the 1930s, which were take home versions of the movie for consumers to enjoy at home. Most of these are lost or destroyed. 
The last one we'll be mentioning is the 2009 Real Classic DVD version, which interestingly displays the Eastman print and the Show at Home print side by side. We can see that the same scenes from both versions were filmed slightly different. And keep in mind that Lon Chaney, the Phantom himself, couldn't reshoot the film for the sound version, so any scenes with the Phantom must be from the 1925 silent version. Finally, there's one last thing to know about the Phantom of the Opera. The movie starts with an uncomfortably long scene of a man holding a lantern. He's clearly saying something, but the audio is missing. So obviously this scene is from the sound version. Remember that they did add new scenes, and the audio is just missing. However, the 1925 silent version of this movie has the lantern man scene too. It even has a close-up that hasn't been seen anywhere else. Why would they record a long, silent scene of a man talking for a silent film is beyond us. Now, it's worth noting that the 1925 version is just a reconstruction of the movie from various different sources. So it's possible that the Lantern Man scene truly came from the sound version and just got mixed up with the silent reconstruction. But, I don't know, the quality really seems to match the silent version, and it's strange that a reconstruction this faithful would have this silly of an error. It is the first scene after all. The Phantom of the Opera has since fallen under public domain, meaning anyone can download it and mess with it as they please. Some madmen have even attempted to color the film. Overall, The Phantom of the Opera, the one available today, is just a mix of the 1925 silent version, which is partially lost, the 1929 sound version, which is also partially lost, different scenes from different versions, and even different camera angles.